Hello and welcome. What gives a rainbow its colors? Why is the sky blue? How do birds stay in the air? Well, science is a phenomenon we all experience, but very few of us grasp. One professor at the renowned Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, is making a name for himself with his unique style of lecturing. I will try to hold my body as horizontal as I possibly can. There we go. No! Ten T with Walter Lewin. Forty-five point six plus or minus 0 0.1 seconds. Physics works, I'm telling you. And through his more engaging approach to science, Professor Walter Lewin has become one of the most in-demand teachers in the world. His legendary lectures are online and free of charge, becoming some of the most viewed videos on sites like iTunes, Google, and YouTube, giving the professor a cult status. We're glad to have him on the show today. Professor Lewin joins us from Boston to give us some insight into his methods of teaching the potentially dry subject of physics. Now, don't forget, we take your calls on the show. You can reach us at the numbers on the bottom of your screen. Professor, welcome to the show. It's good to have you with us. Glad, glad to be here. You have no idea how difficult it was to get here. <laughs> well, physics. I came from MIT. I came from my university. And it was going to be a 10-minute ride to the studio, but no taxi driver knew where Liberty Square was. So it was, I was almost in panic. I <laughs> didn't think I was going to make it in time. Well, and finally, I, finally, I found someone who has GPS, and I got here in time. <laughs> I said physics finally won out. You know, I have to ask you, this: your approach to teaching, I love this, uh, the way you describe it. You say, it's not what you cover, it's what you uncover. Now explain that to me. Oh, that, absolutely, absolutely. Well, when I was teaching, when I started teaching at MIT, which was in the early 70s, I made a mistake that many uh, inexperienced teachers make, and it shouldn't be considered as criticism of my colleagues, but inexperienced people always have the need to cover a lot. And they think if they cover a lot, that they've done very well. But when you get older, and maybe perhaps a little bit mature, then you begin to see that what is way more important is actually not what you cover, but what you uncover. What you have to uncover is their love for physics. What you cover is something that certainly the freshmen and the sophomores to whom I teach will forget very quickly. If you teach them, for instance, as an example, Snell's law, which is a, a law that they already get in high school, or you teach them Maxwell's equations, which you teach them as a, as a freshman, then uh, two months after they have taken the course, they have forgotten about it. But what is important now, that you make them see through those equations so that they uncover something that is hidden in those equations. The equations themselves can be very boring, can be very dull, and can even be terrifying. Right. And that's what you have to take away from them, that terrifying part and you have to make them see through them, and that's what I call to uncover. Well, you know, I, I, cover. I was going to say, Professor, I remember uh, the words of my biology teacher at uh, high school, who's still a very good friend, ironically, uh, who used to say, uh, I'm not here to teach you biology, I'm here to teach you how to learn biology. And I have to ask you, and in fact, let me put an email to you that we got from the United Kingdom. Lorraine from the UK wrote in saying, Professor Lewin always, always gives so much of himself and makes me and everyone aware of the how of life. He makes the seemingly mysterious or hidden exciting. An academic not wanting to keep knowledge personal but sharing it is a very rare bird. I have to ask you, how did you originally get into this style of teaching? You were saying you looked at your, your colleagues and you know maybe they didn't, it didn't necessarily work, but what made you think I have to grab the attention this way? Well, there isn't really not one thing, nor is there one moment, nor is there one particular person whom I can say was my role model. As I started teaching, it gradually um, evolved. The first, I, 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 I want to state once more that I don't want to tell any of my colleagues how they should teach. We have many outstanding teachers at MIT and all over the United States, and what works for me may not work for them, and what works for them may not work for me. But what works for me is, first of all, the most important thing in a lecture is clarity. Clarity is number one. Number two, if you teach for undergraduates, timing is very important. 
Therefore, you would have to dry run your lectures, preferably more than once. I dry run all my lectures three times. You have to demonstrate a love for the field. You have to demonstrate a certain enthusiasm. It has to radiate away from you. It has to be contagious, your enthusiasm. And you have to challenge them. And you have to challenge them by asking them questions, by inviting questions. And what is very important, that whenever students ask questions, you never say, oh, that's a stupid question. You always say, even if you don't believe it yourself, you say, that's a very good question. I'm glad you're asking that. Because if you don't know, someone else may not right. know either. And I have to ask you, and Professor? Then what you uh, go on. I, and, and then, of course, what is very important, you have to make them see through the equations. And if possible, when you make them see through the equations, it's, it's very important if you can somehow relate that to their own world, to the world that they are familiar with. And in fact, uh, you left so out one there, beating them with cat fur. And I'm going to let our viewers just see a little clip of this. Oh, beating uh, a student, a they love it. I need a student <laughs> who actually is wearing preferably not all cotton, and sit down here. Simon, I'm going to beat you with a cat fur. <laughs> and so we will see. Beating a student with cat fur, of course, you know, there must have been a reason behind that. Explain that to us, please. Well, here you see an example of what I mentioned when I said you have to relate somehow to their own world. Everyone knows what it means when you're beaten up. And when you are being beaten up by a professor uh, in a lecture hall, of course, that's something you will never forget in your whole life. And the point that I'm trying to make here is a very fundamental point in physics, which is the conservation of charge. If I beat a student with a fur, then he charges her positively. But I, at the same time, must charge equal amount negative because charge is conserved. If he gets a certain amount of plus charge, I get a certain amount of negative charge. That's unavoidable. That's extraordinarily basic. And now what you do, you have a neon flash tube in your hand, and you touch the neon flash tube between you and the student. So the students, you touch his nose or, or you touch his, his skin, and then you see a light flash between them. And they may later forget a lot of details about the conservation of charge, but they will never forget that you've been beating up at students <laughs> and, that you were, and that you were able to draw a spark which gave light between the two of you. Now, I've got to bring up... Um, it's actually... Go on, Professor. It's actually very, it's very unpleasant. The spark is, you know, you really, you really get a shock but because there's a current flowing... I was going to say, I have to, I have to touch on the, this issue where you say it's interesting when people, don't, they see things around them, but they don't necessarily grasp them. And I'm going to bring up three pictures which I'd like you to explain here. It's the pictures of the rainbow. And I know you use this as an example. Now, the first picture we have, and we're just bringing it up for our viewers, it, this was taken, I gather, in your backyard. It's, it's a rainbow quite clearly visible there. Uh, and explain, explain. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Explain this concept. So you're looking of, at, yeah. so you're looking at that picture? Yep. Are you looking at the picture now? Mm. Well, that's actually very unfortunate because I was going to ask you first a few questions, but now you can already answer those questions, <laughs> okay. of course. When, when I treat, um, when I cover in lectures Snell's law, um, you can just, Snell's law has to do with the fact that when light strikes from, from air to water, that it changes direction. Uh, a, a phenomenon that we all know, that the light changes direction when it goes from air to water. And so you can leave it with that, and you can show them all kinds of beautiful demonstrations with a laser beam. You shine it on water, and it changes direction. But now you ask them some questions about the rainbow. And you say, have you ever looked at rainbows? And they say, yes. And then you say, yeah, you've, ever, you've looked at them, but you may never have seen them. And then you ask them the question, OK, if you see a rainbow, is the red on the outside, or is the blue on the outside? And then you ask them the question, have you ever noticed that there is an enormous difference in light intensity between inside the bow and outside the bow? And of course, they don't know whether red was outside or inside, nor do they know whether the sky was very bright inside or outside. But you are now looking at a wonderful slide that I made in my backyard 30 years ago in Winchester. And my poor daughter, if you show the next slide, right. is holding a water hose and she's sprinkling <laughs> the water around, and the poor woman is crying. She was, I don't know how old she was, it was in seven, she was maybe six years old. 
and she was crying because it was freezing. But look how beautiful you see that the outside of the bow is red. Are you looking at that We're picture looking, with yes. my daughter now? Yes, we are, yeah. And you see on the inside of the bow, uh, the, the, there's a lot of white light coming from the inside of the bow. And if you have time and you show my third slide. It's up now. That is a beautiful slide taken by Doug Johnson at the Very Large Array in Socorro, which is a radio telescope. And what you see there is not only one bow, but you see a second bow, which is something that I also explain in class, why there is a second bow. And of course, if you ask a student whether they have seen a second bow, most of them will say, yeah, we've seen a second bow, but they do not realize that the color sequence of the second bow is reversed over the first bow. The first, which we call the primary bow, the ordinary bow, has the red on the outside and the blue on the inside, but the secondary bow has it reversed. But and look, if you look, if you look very carefully, Ritz, look how bright the sky is inside the primary bow, right. and look how dark the sky is outside that bow. Very clearly there, yeah. And, and Professor, I, I have to ask you this. You know, you, what you're asking your students to do is, and people to do is stop and look, you know, take their time. And an email question, very interesting one, came in from, from New York, from Steve uh, Sirkowski, who says, have you had to adapt your teaching methods at a faster rate as students become more accustomed to a fast-paced world in this age of expanding technology? I don't think that I have adjusted to that properly. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. Uh, I do not, I stay away from PowerPoint as much as I can. I have a very strong rule, and that is never show a student a slide and an equation on a slide. Never show them equations on transparencies. Everything that a student must be able to digest, you should be able to write it on the blackboard with exceptions of pictures. If you want to show a picture of a, of, a, of a rainbow, of course, then you show them a real picture. I like but uh, I try to, yeah, go I on, I try to completely stay away. PowerPoint often falls apart because it is, it is a water hose treatment. Many, many of my colleagues use PowerPoint as a water hose treatment and students cannot digest it. So I'm not sure that I'm doing the wrong thing, and I maybe not. Maybe I don't fully understand the question of this student. Well, I have to. I, I don't have to think say I you, you do. You do take the uh, do take the uh, the trouble to do things uh, such as creating gadgets and like riding a bike, uh, you know, powered by a uh, a fire extinguisher. And we're going to show the uh, the viewers here a, a short clip of one of your lectures where you're riding a bike here. Oh we yeah, that's here a nice Here in 26100, one. made our own rocket. It's a very down to earth model. No pun implied. And this powerful rocket is enough to reach the escape velocity of <laughs> I almost reached the escape velocity, but I crashed. See you <laughs> next Friday. <laughs> I have to say, Professor, we had an email question that came in, and I have to ask you regarding that clip. It's from uh, Safia Amar in Mauritania. And Safia asks, to what extent do you think the character and behavior of teachers influence the learning process, specifically in abstract subjects? I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. What, what does she mean? What what does she mean by abstract objects? I, I, I guess she's really talking about, in, in this case, it's something that's you know, often for a lot of people hard to grasp. So how you behave, you know, when it's, it's tough, tough subjects such as physics, how hard is it uh, to get, you know, how much does it help to, to be different in your teaching method? Well, if I understand the question correctly, but maybe I don't, what I try as much as possible when I have derived some equations and when I want to make them look through those equations, I try to do that as much as possible in a way that they can relate to. And everyone can relate to a rocket, namely that there is there is gas, hot, ass coming, hot uh, gas coming out of a rocket, and then the rocket goes in the opposite direction as the gas. And that's what I demonstrate with the bicycle. <coughs> I have the bicycle, is, the bicycle is powered, by the way, with a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. That, of course, is the beauty of it. And the fire extinguisher is pushing backwards, and then I'm going forwards. I have here a little, a little uh, balloon. And I'll blow up the balloon for you if you can see it. And so if I hold the balloon this way now, and I let the air flow out from the bottom, then the balloon is pushing on the air in this direction. And now there's a very famous law, Newton's third law, 
that if the balloon pushes on the air in this direction, then the air pushes on the balloon in that direction. And that's the basic idea behind a rocket. So when I let this go, you will see it will go straight up and it's gone. <laughs> Professor, I have to show, we've got, about, we've got about a minute left, so I want to show a clip of you where you have a very near, well, what looks like a near miss with a pendulum uh, with a heavy weight on the end. And we're going to show this quickly. Oh, I, I love that one. I trust the conservation of mechanical energy for 100%. I may not trust myself. Three, two, one, zero. <laughs> I have to ask you, with any of the, uh, the, the, the uh, things you've done on, you know, in the lectures, we've just got a, a very short answer, Professor, but have you ever got hurt doing these things? Have I hurt myself? Yes. Yes, I have. <laughs> but, well, I but I always survived, and that's ultimately <laughs> what matters. <laughs> well, we want to uh, have you back sometime and discuss some more uh, of your teaching techniques. Thank you very much for being with us. It was my pleasure. Thank you, sir. And thank you for being with us, too. On the next show, that'll be Monday, we'll speak with one of the uh, greatest basketball players of all time, Karim Abdul-Jabbar. Don't forget, if you have any thoughts about pressing issues around the world, send your emails to riz at aljazeera.net. We'll see you next time. Street Talk is next.